and uh, thank you for coming this afternoon. After the Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed in December, our team at the Department of Taxes, working with a number of agencies and departments, got to work evaluating the impact on Vermonters. What their analysis found was that while these changes will lower federal taxes, most Vermonters, due to the complexity of our system and its connection points to the federal calculation, it was going to innovate raise state income taxes on Vermont taxpayers. If we had taken no action whatsoever or made no changes to our laws, about half of Vermonters, primarily working families with kids, would have paid a net total of $30 million more in Vermont income tax. This team uh, beside me and behind me worked together to develop a smart, simple plan that not only protected Vermonters uh, from this increase, but also achieve many additional benefits in the process. I'm pleased to be here today to highlight the fact that this plan, for the most part, has been enacted into law. Its passage in, in conjunction with our work with the legislature to eliminate the income tax on Social Security benefits for low and middle income retirees provided $30 million of income tax relief to Vermonters. This is important because we not only cut income tax rates across the board for all payers, but it also put Vermont in a stronger, competitive position relative to our neighbors like New York. Further, the changes simplify our tax system and maintain our progressive tax code, where the wealthy pay more than those with low and moderate incomes. This proposal was revenue neutral and ensured working families with children saw the full benefit of the federal tax reductions without requiring cuts in state spending. Additionally, it greatly simplifies Vermont's tax calculation, lowers rates, and encourages charitable giving by all taxpayers while adding stability in revenue collection. I want to thank uh, Commissioner Sampson and his entire team for their hard work in this smart, common sense proposal that will benefit working Vermont families for years to come. As well, Administration Secretary Suzanne Young, who couldn't be here today, but as well, Deputy Secretary Ferlin and Commissioner Gresham for their work. And I want to thank the legislature, the House Ways and Means and Senate Finance Committees for their work in ensuring the passage of this proposal. While we have much more work to do, this relief, coupled with the elimination of the tax on Social Security benefits for many Vermonters, two consecutive years without raising a single tax or fee in the general fund, and level property tax rates for residential players or payers are critical steps uh, to ensuring and helping Vermonters keep more of what they earn and move up the, the economic ladder. As I continue to work uh, to make Vermont more affordable, grow the economy, and protect the most vulnerable, these steps help us move closer to each of these goals. I'll now turn this over to Commissioner Sampson, who will detail some of the specific changes. Thank you, Sampson. Uh, again, uh, thank you to my team uh, who uh, were, are here with me today who really helped uh, track what was happening with the Tax Cut and Jobs Act as it worked its way through uh, Washington, D.C., and then ultimately along the way we're modeling what the impact would be. So we were well prepared and had a, a, design, a plan designed to mitigate that $30 million impact ready to go uh, in February, and that's a really quick turnaround, and so I'm, I'm really grateful for the, the work of, of those folks in the tax department. Um, I want to um, focus on a couple things uh, from a tax administration perspective. Um, you know, the individual changes in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act sunset in 2025. Uh, so part of what we did here in simplifying the tax code and also um, having a stronger connection to federal adjusted gross income was make our tax um, code more resilient to federal changes. So we join a lot of states uh, who are more focused on adjusted gross income and uh, in, in doing so, we, we probably won't have as many of these years where something changes at the federal level and we have to react quickly and sometimes retroactively at the state level. Um, I think the first takeaway for Vermonters um, is that this is a retroactive change. Act 11 uh, from just a couple weeks ago is effective for tax year 2018. So this takes effect for, for 
you know, all tax issues beginning January 1st, 2018. And we, we had to do that to prevent that $30 million uh, tax increase uh, statewide. Um, what else does this mean for Vermonters? It means that right now, uh, with the passage of this bill, I don't have to adjust withholding rates upwards on Vermont income tax, which means, you know, had this not passed, had we not succeeded, we would have had to compute new withholdings on payroll and take home pay for Vermonters would have gone down, at least on the Vermont tax side. Uh, and the same goes for estimated taxpayers. Um, and I think one of the, one of the biggest um, changes that I want to talk about that you know, Vermont is unique and joins only a few other states, maybe four other states, in having a, a credit for charitable contributions or some type of tax advantage for charitable contributions in our tax code that applies to all Vermonters or to all taxpayers, not just folks uh, who itemize. Uh, you've heard me say many times on this topic that one of the biggest changes of the uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act is that we expect instead of only 30 percent of Vermonters itemizing, uh, less than 10 percent might actually be itemizing. This credit is available to anyone who makes a qualifying charitable contribution um, that has a tax liability. They can reduce their tax liability with this credit. So we hope that this will uh, introduce new um, motivations to, to donate, even small amounts. Um, so, and, and I'll go into a little more detail on that. Um, it, it also occurs, occurs to us in the tax community that because uh, up, to, up until now only 30 percent of uh, Vermonters have, have really been in a position to understand itemized deductions and, uh, and the tax preference of giving to charity, um, a lot of them might not know what they should be doing. And so uh, in a moment I'll introduce uh, a tax preparer, a local tax preparer, who can talk a little bit about that. But, you know, bottom line, what we're doing is connecting to what qualifies as a charitable contribution at the federal level and then allowing that contribution to have a 5% credit against your tax liability. So we don't have any more different complicated guidance here at the state level. We will simply be referring to what qualifies at the federal level. Um, and we think that was the, the, the simplest way to deliver this benefit to Vermonters. One, one more thing to, to highlight, the governor mentioned the Social Security exemption. Um, you know, uh, in Vermont, we have about 140,000 Social Security recipients. We are the only state in the Northeast and one of only a handful of states nationwide that don't have some type of exemption, partial or full exemption, ta state tax exemption for Social Security uh, income. This does not exempt all Social Security income for all folks, but about half of the folks that had a Vermont taxable or a Vermont um, tax obligation on their so sorry. About half of the folks that um, pay tax on some or all of their Social Security benefit in Vermont, um, half of those folks will pay less or nothing now. And so uh, those thresholds uh, now are much higher than what the federal thresholds are for exemption. And um, for, you know, about 40,000 uh, Vermonters on Social Security will see lower or no tax on their Social Security income. So that's, that's a big change. And again, it's into this tax competitiveness world. I mean, we do hear from the preparer community and from taxpayers that some decisions are made on the uh, tax environment, both rates and what types of income are uh, taxable. So Vermont is now uh, much more competitive on that type of income with other states. Um, so just real quickly on, on charitable contributions again, um, for, for folks who, who are uninitiated on the tax preferences there at the federal level, uh, contributions to charities, religious organizations, uh, churches, mosques, and temples, volunteer fire departments, schools, veterans, or other cultural groups. These are all deductible for itemizers at the federal level, and now they're uh, available to compute this credit at the state level. Um, keep your receipts. Um, check the federal guidance if you're not sure. There's a lot of guidance. We've linked to it on our website. Um, and certainly call the tax department if you have some questions or if you work with a preparer, they're more than equipped to, to handle that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Patty Bisson, who is uh, a local area tax preparer, advisor, and consultant. Uh, I've had the honor of working with, with Patty since I've been commissioner, and she's worked with prior uh, commissioners as well on the tax technical working group where we interact with area preparers to, to understand changes like this and their impact on Vermonters and, and so we did work closely with these stakeholder groups as we were designing and implementing this plan. So Patty was hoping you could come and give some prepare perspective. Thank you. 
All right, I'm a newbie in this arena. And I'm excited to see so many faces. Thank you, Kai. Once again, my name is Patty Bisson. I'm a tax professional and I'm an instructor and I work with taxpayers and other tax professionals, helping them stay informed on tax and technology, how it affects them and be strategic about it. I'd like to extend my thanks to Governor Scott, to Commissioner Sampson, to their amazing teams. I've worked with many of them. They're very talented and to all of you here today for the press. I have the deepest respect for the work that we're all doing on behalf of Vermonters. The time and talent you put into the content that you make, it saves me time, it gives me access to timely information, it offers, offers me opportunities to think and ponder and contribute to the conversation, and it's brought me on many journeys and experiences that I wouldn't have had without your, uh, your sharing that with us. Thank you for all your hard work, and hopefully some of the information I'm bringing to you today will be useful to your audience. Tax reform at both the federal and the state levels means we're all learning. It's new to all of us. Tax tips, deductions, and rules that were true over the past many years may not even exist anymore or even apply to you today. So here's the takeaway. This is the right year for each of us to spend some time understanding what's changed and then what it means for you. Whether you're a professional working through the tax implications with your clients or you take care of your own tax preparation and just know that every taxpayer has been affected by tax reform. This is not just a Vermont challenge or topic and therefore you're learning right alongside with all of us. Understanding what's changed is going to help you focus your time and energy. Perhaps as in prior years, you usually would put this off until January, February, March, April. But I want to let you know that some of the changes mean that there are things now that you should know that will help you or your clients come tax time. I'll give you three examples. First, with the new federal standard deduction amounts, you may no longer itemize. This means you might assume that you shouldn't keep receipts, such as Commissioner Sampson shared, for your charitable contributions. Perhaps you haven't itemized in the past, and so you don't usually get a receipt when you make a non-cash donation or a regular donation, such as with a check or contribution of some other item of value. However, with Vermont's new charitable non-refundable tax credit, this is effective January 1st, 2018, you definitely should hold on to your receipts because you don't have to itemize to benefit from this, and so this may help you come tax time on your 2018 Vermont tax return. Another example, it affects you when you're collecting Social Security income. I find as a preparer that one of the top surprises that taxpayers learn about is that depending on your other taxable income, you may have taxable Social Security income. It could be up to 85%. That's taxed at the federal level, which means historically that's been taxed at the Vermont level. Vermont has added a new Social Security exemption. There's additional calculations to determine how much is not taxable, but just be aware that these new Vermont tax savings may give you the opportunity to save and pay less now, keeping more in your pocket if you pay estimated tax payments. That's very common with Social Security recipients. My third and last example for today is that data is indicating that the majority of Vermont taxpayers who in the past have itemized may not end up itemizing in 2018. This is because the federal standard deduction has significantly increased. So in prior years, Vermont had an additional form called IN-155. And that form calculated a variety of limitations and addbacks to your Vermont tax return. This will no longer apply. Vermont has instead created its own standard deduction, and these amounts will greatly simplify the calculations on this part of the tax return. In my professional capacity, I'm a resource for over 23,000 fellow tax professionals nationally through a professional organization called NATP, National Association of Tax Professionals. I am frequently asked questions when I volunteer to assist on Vermont tax knowledge about this form IN-155 from colleagues both inside the state and outside the state who are working with Vermont taxpayers. 
this change to a flat Vermont standard deduction will add simplification, and then that ultimately reduces the chance for error or confusion. I hope these highlights and observations will be useful. I always recommend that you speak with a tax advisor, read more about your particular circumstances, but just keep in mind that this is a good year to ask more questions, to read more and become more informed. And therefore, if you're unsure, don't be afraid to ask. Thank you again, Dr. Scott. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Patty. Um, maybe it, now we can open up the, the floor to questions, uh, maybe about taxes first. Uh, and then we'll uh, talk about other issues that you might have uh, questions about uh, after that. Well, here's, here's your chance. You can start. <laughs> All your tax questions could be answered right here in this room. We're, we're taxed out. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said uh, in your opening remarks, you said that uh, the uh, legislature passed uh, the proposal that your administration developed for the most part. Um, what's left out? It was uh, we had uh, we had first come up with this plan for 30 million dollars in total. Um, the legislature decided to take uh, four million of that and use it for Social Security. Uh, we would have uh, preferred the full 30 million dollars uh, for that reimbursement, uh, but uh, but we have to uh, work with the legislature, and, and uh, we'll be back if we think it's uh, something that is a concern in the future. But uh, but it was just a negotiation at that point. Governor, your thoughts on um, the recent results of the tax department missing the July 1st deadline. Some Vermonters are concerned across the state. Your thoughts, and then maybe if I could shift it to kind of explain what happened and what, what you guys are doing to fix it. Sure. Uh, it was, it's unfortunate. Uh, obviously, we're going to strive to do better. Uh, we've, uh, we've already made a commitment. The commissioner has acknowledged that uh, we have more to do. Uh, and uh, not to let it happen in this manner again, uh, and, uh, and I'll let him speak to this and what really happened. Uh, but it's part of the new system that we have developed and implemented in the tax department that scrutinizes uh, some of the, the returns uh, more in depth than ever, and it's to try and prevent uh, any irregularities. And so it's so sensitive that it that pulls a lot of these uh, returns uh, because of uh, uh, data entry and, and other mistakes that are made on the uh, on the forms and flags them, so they have to be done manually. Uh, and so, with this new higher level of scrutiny, uh, it slows the process down because there are so many. But uh, maybe I can let the sure. commissioner explain from there. Yeah, I think first and foremost, we, we acknowledge that this is on us. It's unfortunate for us to hear that clerks and treasurers are taking heat from citizens on this and you know what we're trying to be crystal clear about is that uh, if, if this has driven an error in a property tax bill uh, in those communities that that build in July uh, that's something that the tax department has ownership of and is, has the responsibility of um, so certainly I, I, we compute that uh, of the July billing towns and of the files that we hadn't sent over and scrutinized yet about 4,500 um, in uh, property tax bills went out potentially with the wrong uh, rate, residential versus non-residential rate, or missing a property tax adjustment. Um, the governor's correct. You know, a lot of these are, um, you know, are growing pains of, of staffing and uh, deploying resources between refunds, our 29 other tax types, and property tax reviews. Uh, you know, the, the upside of, of this system is that it's highly dynamic and we can tune it, and it's already been tuned uh, to prevent uh, some of these um, kind of over-conservative uh, flagging of returns. But on the other hand, it has also um, found just this year on the property tax realm about eight million, blocked, stopped, adjusted $8 million of improper payments. Um, so, and that, that absolutely, a, a level of that could never have been detected before. Uh, to, and so that's important for the integrity of our tax system and for the fairness of our tax system. So there, there are certain checks and cross matches that just weren't possibly before. And, and the, the one other thing I'll add, because I know the question will come up, is, and just very broadly what happened was that of the 100,000 plus files that we need to load, uh, July 1, particularly for those July billing towns, we still had uh, 14,000 that were unresolved. We, we still needed human eyes on them. Um, a, a lot of that is um, what we call cur courtesy corrections, where 
that there has been a filing mistake. The most common is the wrong span number, which that, that's that property identification number. Um, wrong town code, duplicate filings, um, and, uh, or uh, the span just doesn't exist. So um, that takes a lot of work. It was our responsibility to um, look at our workload throughout tax season and make sure we had left uh, enough human time in June to get those cleaned up, and, and we failed in that regard. Again, so apologies on that. But if there's there's one takeaway, there's a lot of takeaways for the tax department uh, in communicating with towns. We we failed there. But as far as the, the taxpayer, we just we we really hope uh, extra scrutiny on um, the data that you input into this, uh, and it'll prevent a lot of this. So. Can I ask just for folks who don't have? Tax right. folks who just want to make sure they're filing on time yep. properly. Were you noticing, was this an issue with predominantly e-filers, predominantly people you know, handwriting? Did it matter? Was this purely a computer program that wasn't reading? I, I saw you listed a couple of different right. uh, challenges that popped up. Yep. To explain to, to taxpayers, you know, why are some people seeing it and others aren't? Um, I think uh, a large part of it is there an anomaly or an error on the return. And again, uh, we've always taken the approach historically in Vermont that we, you know, when we can find the error, fix it, and it's clear that, you know, how to fix it, we'll do that. That's kind of that, that courtesy uh, um, repair of an, of an error. Um, but between paper files and uh, electronic filing in this situation, I don't know, Doug, if you have a thought on that, whether there was an error difference or if you know. Yes, um, the the error rate on paper returns is higher, um, generally because it's more difficult to read some people's handwriting, and we do have validations built in to try to lead people to enter the correct information. Um, so the lowest error rates error rates were from people that used our website, my VTAX, and then if they use Prepara software, they're usually usually getting it right, and then about ten to fifteen percent higher error rate on paper returns. Um, so that's, and it's important to emphasize, you know, for the for the viewers, what what happens next. So if you were in a July billing town, so so if you haven't received your property tax bill for this year, um, ignore all this. This this doesn't affect you. Um, but for July billing towns, um, there, you know, check check your bill. Make sure you were billed at the right rate. And if you were expecting a property tax adjustment and it's not there, it could be that next week the file that we send over to towns next week will generate at the town level a revised bill. What you can do to um, figure out if you're in that population and make sure that we act, because every year there's a population of folks who think they filed but didn't or file late and the same thing happens. That's more routine uh, where, the, where we send the new information to the towns in a monthly file and they generate revised bills and that could be beyond um, homestead issues and peak property tax adjustment issues, that could even be current use changes, that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, on our website is, is a, 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 on the front page, it'll tell you how to get to the VTAX website, social security number, and um, zip code, and you can look up, do we have your filing, do, you know, whether it's just a homestead declaration or a homestead declaration and a property tax adjustment. If you see that we have that filing but it's not reflected, in your bill, then uh, you might want to give a call and, and just confirm that we, we that your information will be in the next batch. You mentioned the <clears throat> eight million dollars in improper payments. Is that are those pay, payments that should not have been made to taxpayers, or and what's the source of that? Correct. Um, so. The source can be um, claiming it um, as a homestead when in fact you're not a resident or a part year resident. Um, it can be um, household income issues. In Vermont, the income eligibility for these programs, this includes rent or rebate, um, relies on a very um, difficult form, the HI-144 uh, household income, and where you're adding source different types of income and adding the income of all the members in your household. Um, there, there's a lot of mistakes or abuse, depending on your. We're agnostic as to right. what it is. We're going to fix. We're going to detect it, find it, and adjust it. So those are the main areas where where um, those um, preventing improper payments, which are, improper payments means either errantly or intentionally filed for. <laughs> I have a question, if I may, about uh, actually going over the uh, the 
elimination or reduction uh, for a lot of folks in taxes on their Social Security benefits. Uh, was that something also uh, that came out as a response to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act or something you and your administration uh, had been seeking prior to that? Yeah, this is uh, something my administration uh, I had advocated for during the campaign, uh, talking about eliminating the tax on Social Security. Um, and we put together a plan uh, that uh, we were able to, uh, to work with the legislature on uh, that made a lot of sense uh, for those uh, receiving Social Security benefits. As was mentioned, uh, we're just one of just a handful, uh, like five or six states, I believe, that doesn't give some exemption for Social Security taxes. Okay. Any, uh, <laughs> done with that? Yeah. So feel free. <laughs> feel free. I have a couple other questions on homestead. Oh, it, you want to you want to ask another question about taxes? About the the, the, the homestead uh, business, um, uh, Commissioner Sampson, you mentioned to my colleague Taylor Dobbs that some some of the bills were actually lower than they should have been. Some bills were actually higher than they should have been. You know. the, the potential for both exists, so if okay. uh, it depends on the town and the school spending in the town, but what we've seen in recent years is that approximately half of the towns, the um, non-residential rate is lower than the residential rate. Hmm. Uh, so in those towns, if um, we are still processing the homestead declaration and you were billed at the non-residential rate, by the time we finish processing the homestead declaration, the town will revise your bill to the homestead rate, the correct rate, and in that situation, I think it is more common that um, because it's property tax adjustments and homestead or non-residential rate, so it's more common that the revised bills will be lower, uh, but there certainly will be instances where it's uh, billed at a higher rate in a town where the homestead rate is, is do you, higher. Do you have any idea of the proportion? Um, I don't. Uh, well, it's about 50-50. Oh, of, of this population? I do not. Okay. Um, I would, I, I think most people assume that the homestead rate would naturally be lower. Um, uh, it surprises me that about half the towns it's higher. Right. Um, is that a poli I guess this is a question for the governor. Is that a policy issue? Is that something we should address? Shouldn't the homestead rate be lower? Well, uh, it's been addressed in the legislature before. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in terms of trying to be competitive uh, with other states, uh, the affordability of uh, some of the businesses uh, that, are, that are out there, and as well as uh, don't forget when we talk about uh, the non-residential, we're talking about uh, apartment ho houses as well. So it, uh, it, it falls upon the renters uh, there too. So uh, it's a delicate balance and it's something that the uh, legislature has tried to address over the years and will probably continue to address. And I just want to add, if I may, um, you know, these are a function of, of law and what happens in the legislature as far as setting the yield and the um, setting the non-residential rate. But the, the variability um, in, the, in the residential rate is very closely tied to per pupil spending. So it, the towns where you're going to see a lower non-residential rate, you're going to see a lot of correlation to high per pupil spending. So on the, there are a lot of competing kind of pressures here. One, you know, your, your, your thought of shouldn't it be lower, but then that's countered by the thought of if a town spends more, shouldn't their tax rate be higher? So a lot of, a lot of moving parts from the policy end of that question. <laughs> and since the, the, the non-residential rate is statewide and yeah. the residential rate is set town by town. Right, right. So okay. per pupil spending does not affect the non-residential rate. Right. That, that makes sense. Um, is this something, um, should the, the increased workload have been anticipated either by your department or by maybe ADS? Were they involved in the new software system? No, the, the well, yes, but uh, who, who's responsible? The tax department's responsible and I'm ultimately responsible for the workload. So yeah, for, for me, I should have been more attuned to that workload issue and um, this won't happen again. Um, there's there's several steps already that were, you know, last year we had the first year in V tax of the individual income tax and had similar issues with um, not anticipating the level of um, scrutiny the system would would give or some of the kind of collateral things that happen. Uh, we put together a team um, that worked uh, through last summer and fall 
um, and met with senior leadership within the tax department and completely redesigned and recalibrated how we were doing that and we had as a result a much more successful refund season when it comes to timeliness. Same things already happening um, on the homestead and deciding what's worth flagging and manually reviewing and to some extent that the big revelation is that you know we can do a lot of this stuff after the fact so yes we may have um, some some triggers uh, or some flags on a certain filing um, that we're, we're not sure if it's a proper payment or not but we can send that to the towns we can get that information to the towns yes it'll impact the tax bill and then down the road we when we have the time when when we're not under that type of deadline we can review that more in depth and if we have to uh, invoice a uh, taxpayer for an improper property tax adjustment, we can do that. Commissioner, just for clarity before we jump to taxes, um, you, you say, you know, this is on you guys, you're not going to let this happen again. For, for folks who read and watch this later, how specifically, what, or if some examples, I know you kind of were dipping in a little bit, how are you going to make sure that this doesn't happen again next year? Um, so it's, it's we're, we're redesigning uh, forms at this point because one, you know, to the prior question, um, you know, paper versus e-filing, we're putting in a, um, a um, new scanning system. That's the one piece of uh, the department's technology that has not been updated and that's in, in process right now, has been for several months. That requires a um, redesigning of forms and we work with the, the vendor to help with that. And that process, and, and this is the feedback we've received from preparer groups as well, is like you can probably reduce a certain amount of errors by being more clear on this line about what you're looking for. Um, and just the fact that we'll be able to scan and data capture um, uh, with more kind of resolution basically of paper forms, that's going to help. As far as workload goes, we, we are going to operate next year um, around this issue under that this deadline is a deadline. Everything goes that's complete and timely filed. Uh, even if we have to turn the dial down and let it go, because we'll look at it after. That's, that's kind of the one high-level um, step that we're going to take, is understand that the deadline matters, it causes issues for towns and taxpayers when we miss it, and it's not worth it. It's not worth the aggravation, because um, we can still capture and detect those anomalies after the fact. Any other tax questions? <laughs> there passionate about taxes. <laughs> <coughs> uh, just a staffing question, are, is the state having trouble like some businesses are in finding not qualified workers? In the uh, tax uh, or anywhere in general? Yes. I think we're, we're all uh, suffering in some respects uh, from our workforce issues that we face. Uh, when we go across the state, as I've mentioned many times, there, there are signs out uh, looking for uh, people. Uh, people to fulfill the jobs that are available. And um, we, we, uh, we have those issues, I know, uh, in, uh, in our uh, public safety and state police. Uh, we're addressing some of that, and we're, uh, we're doing it throughout state government. So we're not immune uh, to some of the challenges we face as a state. Any uh, updates on any of the acting or interim commissioners and secretaries? Uh, there will be uh, very shortly. We're getting uh, very close to making some announcements there. What, can you say which ones? Uh, all the ones that are open. How is the security governor? Um, some recent threats of Chicken County against offices. Your thoughts? Um, does anything need to change? Is anything new being done to make sure government employees are safe? Well, obviously, it's our obligation to keep our employees safe, and we take that very seriously. Uh, in terms of an update, uh, I'm not sure if you, you've heard, but in, within the last hour, I believe, uh, the person of interest was, uh, was picked up uh, and is, uh, is now uh, in the uh, custody of law enforcement. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's good news in that one particular threat. Uh, we continue uh, to make uh, improvements with, with safety within our state buildings. Um, and we have uh, a couple of uh, people from our buildings and general services here. Uh, to give you uh, some more details of that, but uh, it was back in, I believe, 2017 uh, that there was a, a capital uh, appropriation of a million and a half dollars for upgrades to, to uh, our state buildings. Uh, we've, uh, we've now committed about 900,000 of that and continue uh, to make uh, progress in that regard. But this will never be over. I mean, we, we have to continue uh, to work uh, to address these needs as they come up. But uh, 
I might uh, ask uh, you to come up and uh, identify yourself and, and yes. tell them a little bit about what we've been doing. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Governor. Uh, my name is James Sides. I'm the Acting Director for State Security under uh, Buildings and General Services. And uh, the last 24 hours, I think, is actually a, a demonstration of the corporation that we use uh, that we had with all uh, numerous agencies, both within the state and within law enforcement, to come together. Everybody doesn't uh, has a shortages of resources, uh, and so when something is developing, when we team up, we can benefit uh, from each other's unique resources. Uh, there was three law enforcement agencies involved, uh, plus uh, Department of Children's Services and DCF, uh, DOC. And there was an uh, extensive amount of communication as everybody had different pieces. And we brought all the pieces together and was assisting in the investigators in uh, coming to an end with this. Uh, for issues within uh, the security and safety of our state employees uh, and our facilities, uh, much is done that is, doesn't have visibility. Uh, we have a, a team that is performing a lot of steps and a lot of different uh, venues. And a lot of it is preventive to ensure that something doesn't happen or if something is starting to develop that we catch it before it becomes public attention or gets uh, that type of visibility and so there's successes that we see every day uh, one of the examples is we have a system we put in place about 18 months ago a reporting uh, mechanism online for our state employees if they see a security a safety or a threat incident where they can file a report and uh, and then we receive that we do the data link analysis, we compare notes with other agencies, and then move forward with the plan before something uh, terrible happens. So did everything work properly when this threat became known? Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Would you please spell your last name for us? Yes, it's fine. It's uh, S-I-D-E-S. Two brief questions, Mr. Sides, if yes. I may. One being, uh, actually, when uh, did all of you become aware of this particular threat or these threats? Um, and the officers that were stationed outside of the two state office buildings in Burlington and also uh, in Williston, which agencies did they come from? Well, I don't want to get into the specifics of the investigation itself, uh, but with that, we all became aware uh, approximately a week ago and when it was a, a lower level threat. But as we were tracking it and the intelligence was coming in and it was developing, uh, we made a proactive decision uh, to place uh, armed law enforcement at those two locations which uh, the threats were geared towards. And I, I would like to add that the threats were at those specific locations and nowhere else. And so uh, we have a contract, uh, we operate statewide with all of the sheriff's departments and then they will provide manpower as needed. Um, in this situation, there, there was uh, a shortage of time, and so in the interest of time and with some limited resources with some sheriff's departments, uh, we then turned to the state police and Williston police uh, to assist as well, and the state police ended up picking it up because uh, they could provide the uh, troopers uh, the most rapidly, and so they covered down in the city of Williston, and then in Burlington, it's the Chittenden County Sheriff's Department that uh, uh, provided security at that building. How specific were the threats? Uh, was it just a general location? Were there specific people? Well, again, I don't want to get in the, uh, the details of the investigation. I would refer you to uh, the Department of Corrections, uh, Burlington Police, and then Shelburne Police, who actually conducted the uh, arrest this morning. And so, but the, lo the threats were in at those locations. Who, which agency made the arrest? Uh, Shelburne Police Department. Do you know what the charge was? Um, a parole violation. And there may be other associated charges. I'd have to refer you to law enforcement for those answers. Well, again, aside from, aside from Shelburne, should we talk to him? Uh, Burlington Police was uh, involved, and then Department of Corrections uh, initiated uh, uh, this report about a week ago. And I missed your question, sir? Was the arrest this morning or this afternoon, or where was it made? It was in Shelbourne. It was just before lunch, from my understanding. Uh, can you say where the arrest was made? It was. It was specifically. In, I do not know. Governor, 
the the ten thousand dollar incentive. How close is that to being prescribed in terms of how it's going to work? And uh, are you surprised that all these people are interested? Yeah, I, I am very surprised that there's so much interest in this. Uh, pleasantly uh, surprised in some respects because uh, I think that this is uh, something that we can uh, we can utilize another tool in the toolbox uh, we're still working on the details uh, but there it continues continues to be a lot of interest in this and outreach uh, from those who want to uh, come to the Green Mountain State and live while working somewhere else are you are you a little concerned that with 2,000 plus people wanting to take advantage of it and only maybe a few dozen at the most can actually do it, that there's going to be a lot of disappointment out there? Well, if, if yeah, I would, uh, I'm not concerned. I, I would say that it's an opportunity. Uh, we'll look for other methods. If this is an area that, uh, that will give us the highest return, uh, think about having more Vermont residents, more uh, people coming to Vermont, uh, and, uh, and that's what's, what it's going to take. We need more people in the state, uh, and this seems like a, a viable solution to that. Well, again, when you uh, when you travel uh, around the state, as I do, and we'll be going, uh, we'll be taking the cabinet uh, out on the road again on Monday. We'll be going to places like uh, on Monday. We'll be going to Windsor County, and I would invite you uh, to come to Springfield and ask yourself uh, whether we should be investing in our downtowns. The new millennials want to be in our downtowns. Uh, they uh, so we have to invest in that. Uh, and again, uh, you, you wouldn't have to travel any further than St. Albans to see the tremendous benefit of uh, investments in those downtowns, uh, the positive effect, the transformation of St. Albans over the last five to ten years has been remarkable. And uh, we're going to see the same thing in other areas as well. Bennington, uh, the, the uh, renovation of the Putnam Block would not be happening. Uh, it's as fragile as it is. Uh, but it, it would not happen uh, without uh, the tax incremental financing. So I see this as, uh, as extremely effective uh, and for those uh, communities that have taken advantage of it. Uh, even Burlington itself, I, I'm not sure the waterfront would have happened without tax incremental financing. So uh, I see this as a, a beneficial to the state. Uh, maybe difficult to measure, but uh, my, from my standpoint, these projects would not happen without that incentive. A lot of confusion on the national <coughs> level this week with the president. Um, how concerned should Vermonters be about what's happening out there? Well, I think we're all uh, concerned uh, when we see uh, what seems obvious uh, to us uh, as individuals, uh, that the, the Russians uh, meddled in our elections uh, and that uh, uh, we should not stand for that. And, and I, I think the president's statements were unfortunate. Uh, bizarre in some ways, uh, and uh, and I believe that uh, we can do better. Uh, back to EB5 for just a moment. The regional center continues to operate while you are appealing its closing? Correct. And so it can process all the necessary documents? Correct. How long do you expect that period to be? Um, well, we believe uh, that we, again, we agree uh, with the federal government. We do not want our uh, regional center to stay in, in existence uh, forever, uh, but we think there is a transitional period where we need to wind this down in a structured way to protect those who, the investors as well as the businesses and so forth, uh, that, have, uh, that have been included in this program. So we are going to make our case uh, with the appeal, uh, and hopefully they'll see it our way in the end. And on, uh, on, on the fraud that occurred, the investigation, I guess, is going to take a long time because the auditor of account can't get, enough, can't get all the documents until the lawsuits are finished? Yeah, there is there's one uh, lawsuit pending uh, in the, uh, uh, the so-called Russell Barr uh, right. case. And uh, until that is satisfied, I'm not sure that all the documents can be, be uh, um, given to the auditor. Uh, but as soon as that happens, uh, as soon as that is satisfied, and, and I don't know what the time frame is for that, but uh, we're going to move along the same path that we started on. Uh, we want to release documents just as soon as possible. We're going to continue uh, with the uh, redacting process uh, in order to be prepared for that to happen. And with the directors of the regional center, James Candido, 
left to go to an EB-5 operation and Brent Raymond left to go to an EB-5 operation and there's a Chinese woman who left to go to another EB-5 operation. Uh, do you think there's th there was a sense that they were not watching properly, they were looking out for themselves? And there's, I know <coughs> conflict of interest laws are difficult here because it's a small state. And yeah. People have a lot of different... As, as you know, I mean, the, the EB-5... Um, Regional centers have changed tremendously over the last uh, since they were the inception. Uh, there was just a handful in the beginning, Vermont being one of them, uh, who took advantage of this. Now there are literally hundreds, as I understand it, uh, throughout the country. So the model has changed, and again, I'm not. I, I don't think it's appropriate for us to be in that business uh, any longer. Uh, so uh, we uh, again agree with the federal government. We should. Uh, we should. Uh, close our regional center uh, when it's appropriate, though, not at this point in time. Uh, in regards to uh, those individuals, I'm sure that they just moved on to other positions and, and uh, we are not uh, taking new applications at this point. We are just fulfilling our responsibility for the ones that are in, uh, in the pipeline. Well, I was suggesting that, that if those people had paid more attention to the problems arising at JP instead of concerning themselves with their own personal professional movement elsewhere, maybe this would have been discovered sooner. So if, I mean, if, if you're a state employee and you have certain fiduciary responsibilities, uh, is it proper to then move to the other side of the, of the table, yeah. so to speak? Well, again, this wasn't under my watch. Uh, this was under a previous administration, a couple of previous administrations. So I, I wouldn't speculate on uh, whether there was any improprieties, but I'm sure the auditor will receive all the information and take a look. Last one from you, sir. Um, increasing number of reported arrests along the Canadian border. Your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I, uh, I read uh, that as well, uh, and uh, we've been We've reached out to Christina Nolan, our U.S. Attorney, who I was proud to nominate in conjunction with uh, the Senator Leahy. And uh, I have uh, full faith in uh, her response and, and the way she's uh, addressing this. Uh, her, uh, from what I've read, it appears that there is just more activity uh, in terms of uh, the border. Uh, and uh, she is not uh, concerned uh, that there's anything elevated that we should be all concerned about. Governor, two things I'd like to bring up, then I'll uh, <laughs> drop off as well. One being uh, the budget. Now that we are un under a 19 state budget and have been for a couple of weeks now, are you looking at anything you may uh, perhaps uh, be able to do, provided you are reelected uh, next uh, legislative session, to perhaps avoid the stalemate we just saw? Well, again, we're going to continue to work to do whatever we can uh, to grow the economy and make Vermont more affordable. And that includes many of the issues that we'll be, we'll be developing our budget. Uh, we'll be reaching out to uh, legislators along the way. Uh, again, uh, we want to, uh, to make sure this is seamless as possible. Uh, we'll continue, again, to work with the legislature uh, to get the best, uh, the best. We all learn uh, from, our, um, from our experiences, and uh, this is the same. Indeed, and the one other thing I'd like to bring up, and I'll uh, shut my trap as well, that being uh, that the individual mandate working group has just started uh, its work to sort of craft the particulars of what Vermont's mandate may look like, just started meeting a couple of weeks ago. Is there anything in particular you might be uh, especially uh, keen on seeing them work on before they come back to lawmakers, I understand, in November? Well, again, health care is a, a huge issue, and that's just one piece of this uh, the big puzzle. And we're, uh, we're working with our Agency of Human Services. I'll be uh, working with the Green Mountain Care Board as well. Uh, trying to develop a, a program that works best for Vermont, and uh, and uh, and I think that there there's uh, some good news. I mean, we've we've made uh, a lot of changes uh, with uh, with the way we provide for health care in Vermont, and we have a lot of work left to do. So we'll continue to work with them, but uh, nothing nothing specific in terms of that. The uh, the Border Patrol has jurisdiction or asserts jurisdiction over any territory within 100 miles of the border, which includes virtually all of, of Vermont. Uh, and I believe there's legislation in Congress to roll that back to, to, to uh, limit that reach. Uh, is that a concern of yours that people could potentially be stopped almost anywhere in Vermont? You know, we've had that for quite some time. Uh, I remember when they, they were I had set up a checkpoint years ago uh, down in the White River, uh, Hartford area. 
Um, but a, I haven't. It's a big inconvenience for people who live there who use the freeway to get around. It, right, right. Uh, but I haven't uh, seen uh, any abuse of that uh, thus far uh, in, in the, lately. So um, I'm not concerned. Uh, we'll let them determine that on the uh, federal level. Uh, Lyme disease seems to be an ongoing health hazard in Vermont. Some jurisdictions in New England are actively trying to reduce the deer herd, which carries the ticks hither and yon. Uh, is there anything that the state is thinking of doing to address Lyme disease? Yeah, uh, again, it is a concern, uh, as we've seen, uh, started, the concern started as far south as uh, Connecticut and then uh, meandered its way into Vermont and, and is uh, something that we're all uh, aware of and we all have a responsibility to make sure that we do everything we can uh, to prevent the ticks from uh, staying on us. Um, in terms of what we're doing with the deer herd, I don't believe it's as big a problem as it has been with the moose herd. Uh, and uh, there's been an infestation on the, on the entire herd which has led to reduced numbers uh, by attrition with the with the ticks, so uh, we'll uh, we'll continue to monitor the situation. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank Appreciate you. it.